and we are live we are live all right great um so welcome everybody uh to the third edition of the gad talk series a series of conversation fostering dialogue in the global art world during this pandemic uh today's topic is when the youth takes over reflecting reflecting on the jameel art center youth takeover 2020 uh, my name is Sophie, I'm the founder of Global Art Daily, and I'll be moderating this conversation with our panelists, Aliya Alawadi, uh, Talala Najjar, and Murad Al-Fagal. Um, so I'll just start with a kind of presentation on the youth takeover, um, and also present our panelists, and then we'll open it up to the conversation. Um, so we, we covered the youth takeover this year at GAD with uh, Christopher Benton, who wrote a stellar, stellar review. And he opened it up with saying that with the youth takeover, Jamil Art Center continues to affirm its position as an essential pillar for emerging artists in the UAE. Um, and so the youth takeover, what is it? It's an annual exhibition showcasing um, the yearly youth assembly curatorial program sponsored by the Jamil Art Center, uh, which is the first contemporary art museum in Dubai, really. Um, it's designed to foster creative leaders aged 18 to 24 and invite the collective design of projects responding to their generation areas of interest. This year marks the second edition and presented the work of UAE-based artists and curators, all aged under 30. Uh, the youth uh, assembly this year, the members were uh, Tala Khalil, Tasmin, Tasnim Tiwani, um, Mohamed Maizen, Daniel H. Ray, Ashe Bav, Saad Bujan, Ali Alawadi, Artur de Oliveira, and Dinal Katib. Uh, the show ran from October 30th to November, 20, uh, November 16th, 2020. And the exhibition theme was Reassigned Values, which is a theme we'll talk about, uh, how, you know, how the assembly came to choose this theme. Um, and so we're joined today by a panel quite representative of the youth takeover collaborative approach. Uh, we have a youth assembly member who curated the show, Alia. We have an artist commissioned by the youth takeover, Talal. And then we have Murad, who's the strategy and outreach manager at Art Jamil and a key organizer of the youth takeover. And um, we're very excited to hear his um, take and his vision behind this initiative. Um, so Ali Alawadi is an artist and writer. She holds a BFA in animation uh, design with a minor in curatorial practices from Zayed University. Raised in Abu Dhabi, she attempts to capture the subtleties of growing up in an ever developing cultural and industrial landscape communicated in her work through the themes of nostalgia, gender, mysticism and globalization. Uh, Talal Khalid Al Najjar is an Emirati artist based in Chicago and Dubai, working towards his BFA at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. He's an interdisciplinary artist um, and who works and combines paintings, drawing, sculptures, printmaking, video, and sound. Uh, he comes from a multicultural background, being Emirati and Amer American, and his work explores a variety of aspects of cultural heritage, society, history, youth, identity, and materiality using and merging these elements in unconventional ways. He has exhibited work at the Sika Art Fair and the Chicago Art Book Fair. And then Murad Alvagal is a strategy and outreach manager at Art Jamil. Murad studied architecture in the US and Jordan and has practiced design in the UAE prior to joining Art Jamil, where he focuses now on youth programs, audience development, and planning strategy. Given his passion for art, design, and technology, Murad is interested in cross-disciplinary approach to building diverse communities and learning experiences. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see, one second. Hey. I'm just, uh, I presented everybody and I'm, um, I'm going to just show some slides now of the, of the. For sure. Yeah. Here it is. So these photos, um, I also, I'm going to link in this YouTube video, I'm going to link to the article that Chris wrote about the show. I really recommend that you read it if you didn't. Um, so the youth takeover, this was the second edition um, of, uh, of the youth takeover. We have nine assembly members here. That photo kind of ran over Instagram, took over Dubai's um, Instagram for, for quite a, a while, like a good week. Um, we have the members here, we have Aliyah joining us. Um, we have, this is Arthur de Oliveira's um, installation. Um, this is Ashe Bav uh, kind of installation looking at 
video games and um, kind of conceptual thing. And this is Talal's uh, excrescence uh, sculpture, which he'll talk to us about today. Uh, next to exhibit it. So, so the Jamila Art Center had the youth takeover and at the same time it ran its uh, shows. And so uh, the Michael Rakovitz show was on view at that point. Um, and then this is Sri's installation curated by Daniel Ray, uh, Zuhur al Sayeh, um, carp, uh, kind of not carpet, but a kind of textile collage that she that she did. This is a section created by Alia, and she's going to talk to us about uh, these paintings, especially this work, um, the Treat Yourself series. Um, and then this uh, Mohammed Halid's um, elevator wall. Uh, just like a, you know, a few images, I think, for the audience. I'll sh stop sharing my screen just for them to to have a look. Um, so we'll opening up to the conversation. Would I, I really want to hear from you about um, kind of presenting um, to to the audience um, this theme of reassigning values? Like how how did it come about? Um, did the, the assembly members choose this theme by themselves or were you involved in any way? Um, how was that relationship between you and the, the youth assembly members? Yeah, of course. First of all, let me thank you so much for all of your support and your invitation for today's panel. Uh, it really means a lot to us to see all the support from local organizations and uh, media as well. Uh, first of all, basically the Youth Assembly program runs from January to November and uh, back in January when we started discussions uh, with the nine Assembly members, uh, we sort of learned from the previous Assembly sort of cohort uh, that it is always better to have a sort of um, launch pad when we start thinking about different ways of investigating different themes and curatorial sort of threads. Um, so this year we had chosen to actually um, talk about Kaizen, the Japanese uh, concept of continuous improvement. And um, as a concept, it's sort of, uh, I don't know, a lot of people might, may know about it. It's more of a business concept that is concerned with um, engineering certain sort of aspects on the very small scale and in return having that impact the overall sort of um, process or business or whatever it is that we're trying to sort of uh, kaizen. And that sort of conversation uh, was received with so much excitement, enthusiasm from the nine members themselves, because we were trying to take it out of the business sort of um, uh, field and just think of it from a cultural point of view. What does kaizen mean for Dubai uh, as a city, for example, for, for creatives who are practicing um, for anyone who's really going about self-development and just as creatives that are embarking on their sort of journeys as, as um, new professionals who are just joining workforce or starting their careers. And during those conversations, um, there was this sort of interest in thinking about improvement and continuous sort of uh, adaptability, if you will. And that was sort of uh, the way that we sort of started talking about adaptability specifically. And right around March or end of February, um, we had been having these conversations about very sort of um, uh, gradual change as Kaizen is. And then the pandemic sort of took full effect and there was nothing gradual about that in a sense. Um, so we sort of were thinking about how to still talk about sort of adaptability and improvement, but talk about it from the perspective of that particular moment in time, which was very unprecedented. And that's, I think, how the sort of members led that conversation and landed on the theme of reassigning values, um, because it felt like collectively as a moment, it was a moment to reflect on everything that had been halted out of nowhere, um, sort of pick and choose of the different things that we decide to give value to as individuals, but collectively as a society. Um, and that's, I think, where everyone seemed like they agreed that this was actually the most important thing that we need to consider and, and sort of diverge from as a theme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting how it, it, the, the, the theme of Kaizen, I, I didn't realize it because I read, um, I think one of the artists or one of the curators mentioned that in one of his prompts. Yeah, um, I think Arthur touched on it Arthur. very, uh, yes, yeah. But actually, yeah, definitely. 
So it was, it was kind of um, an adaptation to its time, this reassigning values uh, thing. Exactly, um, yeah. And, and then I want to hear from Alia, so who chose, so her, her um, kind of prompt, her, her title for her prompt was Adaptation and Self-Care. Um, so Alia, can you jump in and just talk to us so about how did you choose this theme of self-care responding to this idea of um, adaptability, of kind of gradual uh, self-development, self-improvement? Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question, Sophie. Um, so the way that I went about thinking about self-care is that I had just graduated from my BFA actually during the time in the youth assembly. I was there before and I was there when I was a student and now I'm there as an unemployed professional. Um, so uh, I was there in both stages and um, I think the idea of self-care, I wanted to talk about it in conjunction of the workspace as well, because that was also an anxiety that I was having upon graduating. The fact that I did not think that someone like me <laughs> was going to be able to adapt to like a very capitalist, very like um, a stringent workplace. And I guess that was just an anxiety. I guess that's an anxiety that a lot of graduates have, but it really kicked off from there because I realized that self-care also has a lot to do with things like being like the, the femme experiences. A, a lot of it involves like tenets of self-care because I mean when you live an alternative lifestyle there are things that you have to start justifying there are things that you are obliged to start justifying and to start like explaining away and or defending when you're moving about in society and that's just the way it is I mean there are people that are more part of the status quo than there and there are people that just aren't and the people that aren't tend to have a harder time navigating these social cues and these societal expectations and stay true to like being themselves and, and who they are, whether gender, sexuality, and that kind of thing. So, and I think that we also, um, in that sense, put, um, so I think that we also underestimate in that sense, the amount of like mental strain that goes into like constantly having to adapt yourself to a different situation, especially if you are, um, especially if like under the status quo, you are a marginalized or oppressed person. Um, so I just thought of it in that way. And I, but I was doing my, my senior uh, project research on uh, the, the topic of like neoliberalism in conjunction with like cyberpunk and animation and, and all that. But the actual topics of neoliberalism were something that really inspired me to think about stuff from that lens, like to think about it like, but what does that really mean? Like, what are they actually trying to sell me? Um, and I thought that it was really beneficial approaching this because I was thinking about how self care um, in the lens of like capitalist media and advertising, a lot of it is just very arbitrary. And a lot of it is just kind of like, obviously telling you to spend more money on things that you don't need. But also it's sort of um, waters down the entire intention of self-care, which uh, I mentioned in my curatorial brief uh, is a concept that was coined by a black feminist queer author, which I think is really weird that it's been adapted into this big capitalist marketing scheme, despite the fact that it came from a person who was speaking out against like systemic racism and the civil rights movement. So, and like, it went from being this thing of like communal preservation and communal care to basically like buying a galaxy bar and taking a bubble bath. And those things aren't necessarily bad, but also they're very limiting. And I think that at some point that you could argue that they're also pretty heteronormative. Like it's almost like there's not a lot of self-care even directed towards men in terms of advertising, which tells me that that's not really a priority either. So yeah, um, all of these things just sort of culminated into like me writing about adaptation and self-care. And then I also mentioned Danny, fellow youth assembly member also inspired me to look into like radical softness which is something I also discuss mm -hmm. in the curatorial brief. Mm -hmm. Yeah I mean you mentioned uh, I think in the curatorial brief uh, Audrey Lord right and her conception mm -hmm. of, of self-care in the 70s was it 60s 70s um, 70s and 80s 70s and 80s right so the rights movement and thinking of yeah like the, as you said this um, this this kind of reassigning value and reassigning, redef redefining what self-care means in today's age where people mostly target uh, self-care products and the way they do that is by targeting your, your weak points, right? Like you have to kind of face the fact that, oh, you're not super fit or you're not super this or super that and you have to buy our products in order to, um, to get to that point. Um, so it's almost not a violent kind of concept, but it's um, 
it was supposed to be a protective concept and it became more aggressive in that sense. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna talk about uh, um, the Hassana Arif, uh, the Treat Yourself series uh, that I showed. So these were the, the kind of photographs, um, the digital collages or the photographs or could you talk no, about? No, oh my gosh, it was so exciting. She basically yeah. made everything in miniature like all of the things that you see in the photograph are things she constructed and they're like teeny tiny, they're like that small, um, which is really exciting. Um, and that's just something that I generally like about the, about Hassana's work, like scale and just like overall, like sticking to one medium mean absolutely nothing to her. She'll go hard, She'll she's like, go hard or go home. She throws everything at the wall and that's something that I really enjoy about her work. It's the fact that she makes, she, she tailors it to be an experience um, and this work was actually a little bit more subdued, but it was like behind the photograph, it was like a very extensive setup. Um, but in talking about the work, I, I would like to actually introduce Hassana as an artist first. Sure, sure, um, sure. So uh, Hassana Adif is um, an artist and graduate from ZU, ZU Dubai's College of Arts. Um, she's a multidisciplinary artist uh, and she gets a lot of her inspiration from things like film and music, especially like socio-political events. Um, and she also tackle, tackles themes like identity politics and symbolism and gender-based social issues. Um, and we actually had two first meetings. Uh, one was an open call that she did for her BFA senior project. Um, and she was actually crowdsourcing like stories from people. So she was asking for voice notes from people over social media. Um, so my first introduction to Hazana was actually me getting to be a part of one of her artworks, which was really cool. Um, and then our second meeting actually happened when we were both chosen to be in the same internship program in Venice. So we actually ended up living together for a month. Um, and I think in that way, I got to know her really well. Um, those experience like through those experiences, I kind of like familiarized myself with her and like her work. Um, and what really attracted uh, me, like I said before, was that they were so extensive. Um, and she's also someone who regularly tackles like these gender-based like social issues. So I think in commissioning her, it was really about the fact that I was sort of attracted to her way of thinking. And especially during the pandemic, when I think all of us were feeling a little lonely, um, I found myself really wanting to reconnect with her, um, especially during like this really difficult time. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, her work is lovely. It's, I, I, yeah, I showed it in the presentation. It's, um, I mean, it just reminded me, I don't know, it's also this, 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 I think it's in our consciousness, this, this notion of soap and of bathrooms and the way she, she manages to kind of um, draw social commentary, but also, as you say, radical softness, right? It's very much that. It's like, I feel the color is very soft, pink and blue and pastel yellow, but then you look closer and it's, there's things coming out the bathtub and it's, it's kind of disturbing in that way. Um, very interesting. And then I want to hear about uh, Talal. Thank you for joining us. I know it was kind of last minute. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> could you tell us about, about your piece, um, Expressense, and also your, your relationship with Danny and Daniel and how he came about, um, how you guys came to, to work together? Yeah. Um, Danny approached me. Actually, Alia is the one who introduced Danny to my work. Uh, and, and then Danny approached me on Instagram one day and then told me about the um, Youth Takeover exhibition and such. And he liked my work from what he's seen. And, uh, and then we had meetings on Zoom and stuff. And he emailed me the, his curatorial prompt, which was um, under the umbrella of reassigning values, he kind of categorized values as um, three separate things, being values as belief, uh, values as science, and values as wealth. And he was like, choose, I forgot if he said choose two of these to focus on or combine all it, like whatever. So I was um, drawn to values as beliefs and values as science. And he would, uh, on top of that, he would send me these readings to kind of get into his like headspace of thinking. Um, and I sent him readings back like by other, like mostly I guess like artists and theorists or whatever. And um, so I feel like we kind of had similar notion, notions of like thinking about value and such. 
And so what I came up with the, being the concept of excrescence is um, how I wanted to explore how humans re reassign, but like recontextualize, reinterpret it, uh, reinterpret, reevaluate um, cultural values, whether religious or secular um, into like today's like technology driven world. Because I was thinking about how like most of our cultural values again, religious or secular are uh, kind of stem from antiquity or are very ancient yet um, we kind of just adapt it to the new age that we live in. Um, and you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's considered sinful or whatever in today's age was interesting. And I did this by um, the piece itself is a sculpture, video and sound installation. And I wanted, I created this eight foot by four foot monolith that has like all these like um, distorted and like bulging deformations coming out of it as kind of opposed to the uh, conventional monolith being like this sleek kind of structure. And um, I wanted to play with um, projecting virtual distortions of my environments and objects and, and reality essentially onto a physically distorted um, structure. And I feel like the, the distortions that came through that also relate to the distortions of values. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in your, uh, thank you for that. And in your, um, in your text, uh, I really like that, that you said um, as, a, as an Emirati American raised around Islam, Christianity and secularism, um, Talal Najjar draws on his experience living in Chicago and Dubai, two cultural melting pots and architectural icons. Uh, he engages with how humans recontextualize secular versus religious symbolo uh, symbology and values from antiquity in an attempt to withstand today's ever involving hyper reality. And I, I thought of this hyper reality, I mean, I'm thinking of Baudrillard and this, right, and, and I and similarly in the kind of simulation of the real and all that. And I remember when I was in Abu Dhabi studying at NYUAD, like Baudrillard was really influential in my thinking of how I conceptualized the UAE, especially Abu Dhabi, like the new buildings. And I was living on Sadia Island. I mean, we were all were, right, part of this NYUAD group. And we're living on this island and it's very much like a simulation of the real, like it's, it's, it's almost, certain architectural or uh, architectural buildings are, are copies or not copies, but they are, they, they are, I would say like my meat kind of imitations of, of other things that perhaps exist in the other, in other regions of the world. And, um, and then you think of Dubai and like this kind of, what is it called? This international city that they have, right? And then these islands as well the global marketplace or whatever it's mm -hmm. called. Um, and then you have these, these like islands um, with different countries being built in different things. And then, so I was thinking of your thoughts about um, Chicago as an architectural model, Dubai as an architectural model, and how you, what you think about simulation in that way in Dubai. Yeah, yeah, Baudrillard was someone who, he was one of the, I sent Danny a text by him that I uh, read last year I was introduced to last year and so yeah I immediately thought of him and like um Hito Stero stuff like that too and um who else even I kind of was uh influenced by kind of existentialist philosophers and uh such as well and even like Duchamp with the ready-made but kind of taking it further like it beyond that I guess but um yeah I don't know it's 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 sometimes it's like when you look at things abstractly, they're pretty wild. I don't know, you know, like going navigating through Dubai being, you know, my, my home city and how it's like extremely like rapidly evolving, like constantly. Obviously, you know, there's um, some bumps on the way, but uh, yeah. And then at the same time, like this, extremely like technologically like advanced city that's very like cosmopolitan multicultural stuff there's still very much this kind of uh conservative local culture as well which is um like kind of this big contrast that uh, i always think is interesting and it, this type of dynamic um you know exists elsewhere but it, i feel like it's very 
the way it is here with the whole cosmopolitan, but also this divide between uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. local yeah. community and culture versus um, foreign uh, is, is interesting uh, to see, like, I don't know, just play out, you know, in life uh, and, you know, questioning things and seeing how, you know, conservative values are like, yeah, adapted into like today's world, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it stems from, I guess, my environment, kind of these questions as well. And then Chicago, that's it's, it's a, a different case. It is has its similarities, but um, not much of that, you know, mm -hmm. traditional society versus the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it shows in the sculpture, as you said, like it's kind of multi-faith and I mean, not like a reflection on how different maybe faiths have come together in antiquity and how it relates to the tech world today. Um, and so thinking about this, let's just go a little bit, uh, let's zoom out of the show and think about um, like youth and Dubai and Murad, I'd love to have your thoughts. I mean, um, this youth takeover now it's, uh, this year marked the second anniversary. Um, and so um, I was just think I was just wondering if you could tell us about the driving force behind creating the youth takeover. Uh, if like basically is it much of your creation or was it a collaborative um, project within Art Jamil or within the Jamil Art Center? Um, and also, yeah, have you found any kind of uh, milestone moments in the past uh, two years that you'd like to share about the youth? Yeah, program? definitely. So uh, when we started the youth assembly program last year, uh, before the opening of Jamil Art Center even, we had the first cohort sort of visit the center back when it was a construction site. Um, and that was on purpose. We wanted to sort of have the assembly be a cornerstone sort of component to our community, but also to our programming and the way that we think about um, how do we put forward our programs. So the sort of entire um, impetus, if you will, of the youth assembly was to have the youth themselves create these programs and, and just for us to support and offer the resources that we have, whether the buildings or our network. And during the earlier conversations with the first cohort, we were thinking of how would we um, sort of establish the Jamil Art Center as a place for the community? How can we establish a community that's, um, that understands that it's not only about wanting to be an artist, for example, it's, it's about critical thinking, it's about being a creative in the most widest sense. And that comes from the fact that they are very cross-disciplinary members themselves and, and they have that sort of urge to make all the time. Uh, and what, during the conversations, I can't exactly pinpoint when, but we noticed that there was this sudden and like overwhelming excitement every time we would mention uh, making or producing or putting things together. And so we picked up on that and we sort of were discussing how can we manifest that in the best way possible. Um, and that's when the sort of idea of just literally giving the entire center to the youth assembly to do whatever they want with it. Um, and it was, it was a group effort in that sense, the way that it was conceived. Um, and we, we worked a lot from, from our team as well to sort of try and formalize it and put it into form that would be received well by our audience to basically understand what this is what this new concept is and what we're trying to do through it. So that basically gave birth to the first youth takeover. And back then it actually was staged in one day. So we just, it was a one day sort of exhibition where everyone sort of comes in and sees these different um, interventions. And they ranged in the way that they were presented. Some of them were inside, outside, and we had uh, performances and it was like a full on day type um, activation. And that, I mean, back then we were not planning on keeping it for more than a day, but then there was this demand of people that were just coming back to see it after that day that we extended it for two weeks. Um, and that was literally by popular demand. So that was the first sort of experience and it was very positively overwhelming in the sense that people came to see the works. They were having conversations about the works. We felt like we were reaching out to new audiences that wouldn't have typically um, come in to visit us, which is amazing that we can actually like sort of crawl into all these different um, groups of people that are finding interest in what we're doing. And the fact that it was put together by the assembly themselves also sort of gave it um, that different sort of tone that it was for them by their own peers. 
which was amazing. So that was about the first takeover. Um, because of that success, we thought, we thought that it has to sort of be our flagship cornerstone type of exhibition. And for this year, uh, because of the pandemic, of course, things had to sort of take a different form. Um, but I would argue that it sort of pushed us in a much better direction, actually. So we have spread it out over the length of the two weeks and we had an, an entire sort of program, public program uh, with components offline and online, which ended up sparking so many more conversations than we had hoped for. And that was, and that was really great. Um, and it had engaged the, the community, um, not by just visiting us at the center, but we've like managed to go to all sort of corners of the world through the different programs that we've done. And participation was people from Sri Lanka and Italy and, and the UAE and uh, India joining for a workshop that's talking about something that's stemming from, from the theme itself. Um, so in that sense, the sort of flexibility and the openness of the program, I would say, is what sort of allowed for that to happen. Uh, we are very trying, like we're still trying to keep the program as flexible and as open as possible and not try to force anything on the sort of cohort themselves. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that sort of morphs and like sort of comes into a different form next year uh, with the programming and the new cohort, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a bold move from from our Jamil and from the Jamil Art Center to be like, okay, here you go, a bunch of uh, nine people who didn't necessarily curate before or, or have uh, experience at least in a large museum setting, and the fact that you kind of give this this wild card to them and you let them yeah create, and then they have the, you know it, it kind of drives them to do more and then to get their community involved, and I guess it's just this creates this beautiful synergy. Um, Definitely. And I mean, we, we, the ultimate sort of goal to, to benefit this, the assembly members themselves is to try to pose it as a learning opportunity and what's better, what's the best way to learn other than actually doing. So some of them like Alia yourself as well, like you're an artist, but you've ended up sort of commissioning and curating and that sort of overlap gets that opportunity for the different assembly members to take the role of the artist, but also the public programmer and the cultural sort of ambassador and the, the artists themselves. So, um, and it was completely open. So some of, some of the assembly members had contributed with work and curated other work. So they were like, at the same time, the artist and the curator, mm -hmm. uh, which we hope was a learning experience for all of them to sort of put, be in these shoes and, and uh, yeah, go, go from there. Yeah, I mean, I want to hear from you, Alia. Like, um, have you like did was, was this the kind of biggest exhibition project that you took part of, and like, what um, kind of learning experience did you get out of it? So my my BFA is actually in animation and curatorial practices. Right. Um, and this was definitely something that I could utilize the the minor that I took like I could utilize the information learned from that but to be honest the experience was um I thought that it was going to be overwhelming but the experience was honestly super rewarding like I even if I were to be asked to commission an artist I feel like I wouldn't even know what the first step was but the fact that we had like two guides there with us showing us every step like what we should expect from the artist and it was a, a valuable professional experience but also like a really great curatorial experience just like looking because I feel like every arter is uh, art arter <laughs> I just mixed an artist and curator together it's <laughs> <laughs> um, every, <laughs> every artist is kind of a curator in a way like each of them is sort of has sort of a critical eye when it comes to at the very least their own work and I'm sure that everyone has opinions on like what work that they actually enjoy so that but utilizing that in a way that the thing that actually happens like in front of you especially during this time where not everything is tangible and everything is online like it was definitely it felt more rewarding than if I were to actually like keep physically being there with them because then I feel like the end result was just so much more exciting because I'm just like finally something I can what kind of touch like you weren't allowed to touch it but like it was good to see it like there but I think that in that way, the experience was super valuable because I think that it really helped me develop like a sensibility as a curator, um, especially in terms of like choosing location and where it was going to be and considering like what happens when we put this work next to the other work? What does that say? Like, how does that mess with the flow of the exhibition and that kind of thing? Um, so all in all, it was um, 
it was harrowing at first. I'm not going to say that I wasn't completely like super nervous about like, oh my gosh, what if they're late on install day? Oh my goodness. What if the artwork doesn't arrive on time? What if the framing is messed up? Because they always mess up the framing. Um, so there were so many things that I was nervous about, but I was glad to be given the opportunity to be able to curate two works um, that I personally would have wanted to see in an exhibition that I would go to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, that's so empowering, right? Because it's it's still an exhibition in a big museum institution. So many people visited, and the fact that you you contributed firsthand um, must feel empowering. Like you you feel like maybe you can do more exhibitions in the future, and now you have all this experience, and you can bring that to your future projects. And um, I guess that's the whole point of it, right? Um, and then Talal, I want to hear from you as well as an artist. Um, how was your experience in terms of like, did you, um, when Danny first approached you with this idea, were you like super, super excited? Was this kind of a, the biggest venue that you had uh, shown in at the time? Um, and I mean, what, what were your thoughts? And now your thoughts reflecting back on the experience. Um, yeah, when Danny first approached me about um, the youth takeover, I was psyched, it, it sounded wild and uh, I had, obviously known about Jamil Art Center. Um, and I thought it'd be yeah, really cool to exhibit in a, a large like museum, essentially. Uh, and yeah, it's the first time I exhibited in a space like this, uh, like a museum space, also kind of being uh, like among these other exhibitions with really big artists or like more like established artists. Um, and having the youth literally take over. I thought the whole concept was great. And, uh, but I hadn't heard about the youth assembly and takeover until this year, like this year's one. I had heard about it and then Danny happened to approach me. Um, and it was really fun to do. It was really fun to work with Danny too. Cause like, it was this whole, I, I've worked with curators before but um, not in the same way I did with Danny. Like, in the past, um, curators were um, kind of just, I saw my work and then they're like, okay, this is where it's gonna be placed and great. And um, whereas here is like a whole back and forth, me and Danny collaborative thing going on, um, always meeting. And yeah, cause of the whole pandemic, we all, and also him being in Dubai, me being in Dubai, it's like, we had so many Zoom meetings, but at some point I was like, Danny, I'm coming up with Abu like, 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 <laughs> I was like, we're working together on this. I need to, we need to link, you know, in person. Um, but yeah, there's, it, it was a lot of uh, fun making the work, um, reflecting on the work, sending Danny, um, you know, reflections and him uh, responding and feedback and stuff. And it worked really well. And like, I, you know, there are some things, like there is a moment where I, I um, initially the sculpture was gonna be white for the sake of the projection being clear, but I, I, was, I was just like, Danny, I'm painting it. And he was like, wait, is it, you have to test it. Is it gonna work with the projection? I was like, I'm painting it, it's gonna work. And uh, <laughs> so I kind of, I freaked him out. I scared him, but uh, it worked. And uh, I think it, it gave it a nicer effect and Danny liked it as well. But I gave him a little heart attack. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine it in white now. Like I've seen it. Like in exactly yeah I it, yeah it looked like it was always meant to be <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure yeah. I always wanted to paint it but then uh it was the first time I was doing a video projection onto a sculpture so I was like I, I you know how the logistics of that and um but this yeah this works better because I mean my other sculptures play with the concept of kind of creating um creating sculptures that look like uh, materials that they're not, you know, made out of really crude material. Cause this is made out of like styrofoam, plaster, um, gauze, tape, like aluminum. Uh, so, but then kind of like using this falsity of, and of like illusion and such to like uh, make it so it's perceived to be something way more uh, valuable almost you know whether it's stone or metal or it has this both literal and metaphorical kind of weight to it now because of the manipulation of um, material but um yeah also another a fun thing about install is we're figuring things out and because where I was installed 
in between um, Rakowitz's show, there's, um, it was in this hallway and there's this kind of courtyard where there's like daylight shining. And so it kind of like uh, fuzzed, like fuzzed, I don't know, fuzzed out the projection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then I, gradually as it, it, you know, gets darker, gets later at night, it, the projection takes hold. And I thought that was actually really interesting that the sculpture uh, component of it is very prominent in the day. And then as, you know, time goes by slowly, the um, projection, the video is taking over and kind of uh, giving its, you know, presence and being very assertive and such. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, tangent. Oh, yeah. No, Great no, no, no. Like, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, right. So, I mean, I, I think in general, you guys did, both, I mean, all of you did such a good job opening this during a pandemic and kind of <laughs> injecting some hope and some force in it. Um, I guess, as, as Murad said, it was a very offline plus online experience. Um, but I mean, a lot of people came for the opening day, right? So still a lot of people got to see the work in person. Um, and I guess, I mean, I mean, I've heard of many kind of, I don't want, maybe we can touch upon like, you know, how, how was it to open during the pandemic, et cetera. But I mean, I guess I can understand it's, it was a bit of travel restrictions between the Abu Dhabi and Dubai Emirates um, that kind of complicated things for you guys. But uh, the fact that you managed means that, um, I mean, maybe Murad, you can take this in terms of next year. Imagine if, if you could do like a youth takeover without the pandemic, how, easy would that be or 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 how what lessons from this year would you say are, are relevant for next year perhaps like public programming or yeah definitely i mean i feel like so in an alternative reality where the pandemic doesn't exist yeah. i think um things would have been a lot more localized in the sense that we wouldn't have been pushed to put on that sort of programming online which turned out to have its own sort of advantages as well uh, but then because of the fact that it was online and we were aware of how like fatigued maybe the audiences are with all the sort of new shift into this format, spreading these different public programming opportunities into over the two weeks, I think was something that we'll definitely consider for the future, regardless of the sort of current pandemic situation. Because I think that allowed for these different sort of touch points at which you can interact with the work in a more intimate setting and just take the sort of concepts and ideas and theories behind that and just um, dive in, into um, that conversation with others who are also joining you um, and adding to the sort of conversation. Um, other things I think in terms of scale, maybe, I don't know, like I don't wanna speak on behalf of, of our future cohort of assembly. I don't know what they're gonna decide, but that's again to the point about having that flexibility and openness in the program, they might want to decide to do something completely different and we're completely behind that, like we're in support of it. Um, but definitely in terms of scale and the fact that maybe our objectives would change by then uh, based on our understanding of our audiences, maybe by now, um, all, like not to brag, but I feel like we have sort of broken ground into the creative community in Dubai. So maybe we can start thinking about offering different opportunities um, other than just featuring work, maybe we can start thinking about sort of, for example, talking about new collectors. Maybe there's people in the community who'd want to start collecting art. And what does that mean? Um, like a lot of different initiatives as well are also thinking about that at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very exciting to think of, of, of the near future where the pandemic yeah. is gone. We can go back to like sort of having food and like music and, and be uh, together and just have that sort of it was about that sort of um, vibe that we had uh, of, of wanting to feel people around us and wanting to feel um, that sort of buzz in the, in the building. Mm -hmm. um, and we, to, to an extent, we felt that, but of course there was these restrictions. Uh, on opening weekend, we had the, the center was booked out for the two days, which was amazing. Uh, and that was like the best we could hope for in the, in the current circumstances and taking all the measures and everything. Of course, of course. I mean, still quite a record uh, for, for the for second edition, right? Of the yeah. Um, yeah, and then 
Aliyah, I was wondering actually if, if you had any advice to give for the next generation, the next cohort of um, the youth assembly. Um, I mean, just one thought I had was perhaps, I mean, there were, there's nine of you with a lot of different perspectives. All of you are very, you know, you come from different backgrounds, whether it's curatorial studies or, or artistic practices or architecture design. Um, Perhaps there was some like disagreement between between all of you and like w were there any and how did you resolve them? Um, or if you want to give any other advice for the future cohort. Um, actually, in terms of like there being disagreements, I honestly feel that the situation that we had post pandemic was everyone trying to be as diplomatic as possible. Like I <laughs> honestly don't feel like there were a lot of at least significant in any way disagreements between us because I feel like us getting together like every month and speaking about something that was like detached from like the mundane reality of like life as we know it under the pandemic I think it was really like intellectually stimulating to be honest I think that um at, at the very least I was always looking forward to doing the meetings because it was just like oh my gosh three hours where I can actually talk about something and not like watch reality television you know what I mean so it's like it was a great <laughs> it was a great um it was a great sort of like mental escape and like mental stimulation really I mean in terms of disagreements I don't think that there were any really big ones I think that most of us were on the same page um and on no the one of the two assembly members honestly I just want to bring up Dina and Tala fought like constantly and it was hilarious <laughs> It was awesome. It was always it was always the thing that broke that like broke up the meetings at the end. Like in the end, they would just always fight, and we would just be like, "Okay, bye guys. See ya. Have fun. See you next month." Um, so it was just it was just like a lively bunch of characters that I think, and we all gelled really well together. Um, we delegated tasks really easily. So I think that if I were to give any advice to the next cohort, I think that just what really worked for us was the fact that we each embraced like the fact that we were like in this group and very like diverse like you mentioned like the fact i think diversity as i mentioned before was, is was like our biggest strength because i think that it gave so much more like body to the show because everyone was doing something different everyone interpreted it in a different way um uh there were talks about like sibling relationships there were talks about like um alchemy there were talks about self-care and i think and all of that fell under the umbrella of like one huge theme so I think that embracing the diversity and the practice of each member and just like putting that into account when you're uh curating the actual show is benefit would be beneficial and I think because of that it we got a really great show out of it yeah I mean that's an example I think for all institutions to kind of look at this the success of the youth takeover it's give power to the youth and then also hire a diverse group of curators right like um and diversity of thought then translates into a great diverse show and then a diverse audience as well. And it's kind of um, celebration of diversity in that sense. Um, but so, I mean, you know, thinking of like um, the show and the, so you said, no, not, not too many disagreements, that's great. Um, and then, yes, sorry, I forgot the question. My question is quite simple. It's one of, uh, how does it kind of work to, to get um, chosen as a youth assembly member? Like how were you chosen as a youth assembly? Can you talk about just the, the process of that um, for anybody who's interested? Yeah, so I, I can just walk you through the sort of typical uh, process. So uh, it's open for nominations. Usually we announce an open call for nominations and we receive nominations from our network of educators, curators, artists, and everyone in the community. Um, when we receive a nomination, we usually do a short list. And um, it's usually, maybe it's not a, exactly a short list. We try to actually meet one-on-one -on -one with everyone who has been nominated um, and have a conversation. And, and most of these conversations are more, it's like an interview slash conversation about the sort of different aims that um, uh, prospective members would want to sort of achieve through that opportunity. And, and through it, we try to choose members that would sort of complement each other in the sort of um, way that they think, the way that they work, their skills. Um, and I think that so far has worked out great. 
in the sense that um, like this sort of perceived and actual sort of diversity was on purpose. So we try to put together nine members who would complement each other in the way that they think, but also they would have that synergy where there's um, skills that are complemented across the board. So that would make it much easier for them to sort of delegate these different logistical parts of putting a show together, for example. Um, it is very competitive in the sense that when we started, we received uh, 50 nominations that we met with all of them. And that was like a great sort of learning experience for us as well to sort of have 50 meetings that you can think of as focus groups in that sense, uh, to understand really what the creative community is at the, at the time that we were starting. And this year we received almost double of that. So that was amazing. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, really looking forward to see what happens with the third cohort. And um, I think also we're opening it up in that sense where, I mean, it's always been the case where the nominations could also be self nominations. And we've had quite a few of this year's assembly as well that felt like they want to nominate themselves and ended up also being part of the cohort. So it's amazing to have that sort of to see that there's that agency and that sort of um, excitement about the program that are self motivated and self driven. Of course, of course, and they're great numbers, and I'm sure next year it'll be even more. <laughs> so it's great in that sense that it's almost like you, you as, as the Jameed Art Center, curate this group of curators who then curate this show, right? It's kind of yes, um, exactly. <laughs> kind of it's, a, it's an inception of sorts. Yes, it's an inception of curation. Um, that's great. Uh, yeah, no, and and then in terms of the the artists chosen, so. Um, every assembly member could choose up to kind of three artists or was there a certain number yeah, or not? So, so basically um, after selecting the main sort of uh, theme of reassigning values and having that piece um, of writing uh, finalized and sort of all these different ways of diverging from it, uh, each of the nine assembly members were uh, assigned to write their own curatorial brief. And that was basically to say, how are you going to take this theme into your area of interest, and and what are you, who are you going to uh, commission? And that sort of conversation happened in parallel, where we were thinking of uh, these different profiles of people that they had brought to our attention. And after we have sort of finalized the, a round of feedback on their own curatorial prompts, we were like, okay, now you can share it with your network. Uh, we aimed to about three artists per. Um, per member. And uh, they requested these artists to propose, to propose or like provide us with a proposal that talks about the sort of how are they responding to that theme? What is their medium? What is the sort of envisioned final work might look like? Um, and we tried to accommodate as many of those as possible. Uh, and we ended up with, um, if we count everyone who's also taken part in the public program, we ended up with 25 mm -hmm. upcoming artists and, and creatives. Yeah, no, that's fabulous. Um, and then maybe tell her, can you talk about the, the effects of the, the of this participation in the Jamil Youth Takeover on your own, perhaps on your own practice in Dubai, or have you felt like you've kind of gotten more opportunities thanks to the participation in the Youth Takeover? Um, or did I it open any doors? Did it, did it kind of open you to any new relationships with um, curators, artists? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, like through the, you know, the takeover, I met Danny and then, you know, when I came to Bubabi, kind of met the whole, like this whole community of artists, including Alia, uh, but we kind of had known e of each other beforehand and uh, many other artists. And then likewise in Jamil, also like even just on the opening day, kind of um, meeting everyone, all the other artists because everyone's curious to like who made that one and because you're involved but it's like we haven't we don't see anyone else's work until opening day which is a sort of you know surprise which was fun um and it's like i met um Zuhura Saleh, who was also commissioned by danny who i hadn't met before and had also went to um, my university at um, saic in, in chicago and uh so yeah i think one the it made a lot of these kind of connections and community like among artists and curators. Um, and then I think, yeah, the Jamil show got a lot of attention and then, you know, thus the piece I made 
also um and uh yeah like i i um was asked to give kind of like a talk and a virtual studio visit for um, ZU students, I university students. And, you know, they brought up the Jamil piece. They wanted me to um, speak on it and such, and also that experience to, to kind of give like insight to uh, artists who are still students or kind of like um, not exhibiting artists yet or like what to expect, how, how to navigate around that um, and to kind of get those opportunities. But yeah, it was great. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great to hear. I'm sure it's super motivating for, you know, artists to, when they hear this, they want to definitely be part of this youth takeover. Um, and maybe we can close it off with a final question, kind of this grand question about youth and Dubai. Um, and tell us that since I have you here, I wanted to ask you, like, would you imagine such an initiative happening in Chicago versus in Dubai? I feel like Dubai is a young city and, and the Jamil Art Center is a young institution allows for these kinds of bold moves and these very, but very successful kind of initiatives. Um, and I guess Chicago with its history with the Art Institute, um, like, would you see some kind of initiative or exhibition like this maybe in another space maybe in a commercial space like a pop-up shop or like a kind of hybrid model but would you see it like a museum do such an initiative yeah i don't know about like i think the art institute maybe not or i just haven't seen such an initiative you know like i guess because it i don't know if it's like they have their own established thing yeah. going on, you know. But um, other than that, around the city, when it comes to galleries, exhibition spaces, uh, pop-up exhibitions and such, um, that's very much um, kind of youth-driven from what I've noticed. Young people, you know, from like, you know, late teens to like late 30s or something like that. And um, yeah, a lot of like, um, self-driven stuff by artists themselves to be like um you know i want to put on the show and i know all these other artists in the city and let's do it we just need a space and then a lot of things like that happen in chicago but um and then i think the mca the museum of contemporary art do not like a youth assembly type thing but they they kind of work with kind of young artists in the city um not not too young but yeah like uh but i think it's it's a great thing to happen for institutions especially especially museums uh so i think it was great and uh to see it happen here too because um i don't know the the art community or like artists and creatives um kind of previously i think it's progressively throughout the years in dubai and the wider country um the art communities kind of been coming together more or more artists meeting each other and then um, institutions kind of reaching out to individual artists um, and such. But yeah, I think what Jamil did with their uh, youth takeover, their youth assembly is like a really great initiative. It's, it's wild to see like, yeah, going to a museum and see youth literally take over the space and put their work you know, among these, you know, great big artists and such. Exactly. It's a very wild dynamic. That's very necessary. Very good. Um, Aliyah, do you have any uh, last thoughts to share about youth and youth-driven initiatives? Um, I think that the, the Jamil Art Center, the Youth Assembly specifically, I think sets a very important precedence that for institutions at the very least. Um, I think that it directly sort of goes against this perceived like rigidity that you usually find when like involving yourself with like art institutions or galleries. Um, and I think that this like, to be honest, it, this felt like surprisingly very simple of an idea that's I, that I've actually never seen before done here or at the very least anywhere else because my experience with like a lot of the n not all of them obviously but like my experience with a lot of the artists that I know from the United States um some of them have expressed like this uh 
this feeling that they're sort of fighting against the institutions um, rather than working with them to sort of get their work represented. Um, obviously that doesn't speak to everyone, but it is important when you think of it in like terms of like the youth assembly where it's just like they're sort of inviting you in and just allowing you to change the space and just allowing you to take over and, and giving you full creative control. Um, and I think that that's like almost too good to be true, but uh, it happened. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, I just think that it's a really important thing um, and uh, a really important, it sets a really important precedent. And I think that um, I'm really excited to see what next year's youth assembly comes up with. Um, I'm really curious to see like how they would kick off from, from cause like everything derives a little bit from the thing that happened before. So I'm just wondering like what of the things that we did are they gonna keep and what are they gonna throw away? So I'm excited to see like what happens in the future in terms of like how uh, the youth assembly next year is going to be but also I'm excited to see how this is going to change like the way institutions choose to, you know deal with emerging young artists. Yeah. I mean, you raise an important point, as you said, like a lot of artists kind of work outside the institution or view the institution with all of its kind of complexities and these establishment and they want to do something new, they want to start outside, they want to create their own spaces, etc. But I guess that's the beauty of, of Dubai, of the Jameen Art Center, of like right place, right time. This The, the fact that funding is available within the Jameen Art Center to, to produce such a, an exhibition and to to showcase that um it's quite extraordinary so so yeah Muda, do you have any lasting words as the just as uh, of, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just back to alia's point about like the different components uh and what 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 this year's assembly has done um, so part of the online program was this uh, online space, which is called Verticals. And um, I really want to sort of highlight it at this point in the conversation, because that I think would be the remnants of the takeover and the entire program. And it's a very sort of um, dense place with content and, and pictures and, and a lot more information about the works themselves, which I think uh, a lot of the audience would find um, interesting and sort of uh, maybe enriching even. Uh, so I would sort of want to say that everyone should check it out. It's verticals.space. And uh, hopefully maybe the next next year's assembly will actually uh, build on it and make it a bigger sort of component and try to uh, expand on it as an online space for these conversations and as a forum as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're really, I'm really like really excited personally for next year's as well um, to see what effect can we actually take and how this sort of, um, how does it affect, how does it change things for us now that people know more about the Tumil Arts Center, now that creatives are from a maybe younger sort of age know about Tumil Arts Center, I'm really excited about the different opportunities that they're going to come to us to try and realize and um, and that's really, yeah, something that really excites me. So looking forward. No, that's great. And as you said, like you've said precedence really with your openness of mind. I think that's what we can take out of this takeover. It's the, the open mind to, to various des design or architecture or, or, you know, curatorial undertakings from, um, yeah, just openness and not, not necessarily judging in terms of age, in terms of background, in terms of education, um, and just welcome, in terms of nationality also, you welcomed all nationalities, not just um, necessarily Arab or necessarily Emirati. It, just, it was a diverse group and I think we can applaud you for that. Um, and with thank that, you, I thank think- Thank you so it, much. Of course, of course. And I think we'll end today's talk. Um, we're a bit over time. But I want to thank you again for all, all of you for your time. I hope this conversation will be useful for the next generation watching. Um, I'll be live, I'll be uploaded on YouTube and I'll also link to this vertical space um, website for sure. So people can click on that. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie. Thank, thank you so you, much. Sophie. Thank, thank you. you. Love the life. Take care.